It, it really does. Lord wants to speak to you, and I hope you want to listen. Not check your phone. Yeah, don't be cheap like that. Listen to what Lord has prepared for you to hear. Um, title of the message for today is Repent. Have you repented? Look at, look at me, please, people. Have you repented? We have all these different looks, I'm telling you. I'm really asking this question because uh, that's the first message of the New Testament. And that's the first message of, uh, of the Matthew. Have you repented? Repent, and the reason is because the kingdom of heaven is near. Assuming that you are not part of the kingdom. Okay, this call for repentance is for those of you who are not uh, in that part of the kingdom. You have nothing to repent if you're part of that kingdom, but when John the Baptist and Jesus, who will be preaching the same message, believe it or not, it will be the same message, the first message of the gospel is repent, which means you are not part of the kingdom. No human being is part of this kingdom. That's why Christ came in. Have you repented? I'm seriously asking this question. I'm going to ask this question again. I didn't say whether you went to church for a long time. I didn't say that. Have you repented? For the kingdom of, uh, of, of heaven is here. What does that sound like? It's a warning. It's a warning. Doesn't it sound like a warning? The kingdom is near. It's a warning. Bible gives warning. Salvation message always goes with warning of wrath and judgment. I know in our culture and in our world, you don't want to hear that kind of words because that's so not loving. Excuse me. That's the gospel message. In Matthew, uh, in fact, in the New Testament, this is the first message spoken and the gosp first gospel message is about repentance. And we try to do Christianity without repentance. That's dead religion, which John will speak about. Repent means completely turning around. We're going to talk about that a little more. Uh, from where to where, which direction. We sing it all the time. The world behind me, the cross before me. Unless that's your direction, you're following the world toward destruction. That's what the gospel speaks about. Okay, Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is near and the king is near. And when the king comes and the kingdom of heaven comes and the imminent wrath and judgment of God. When we say salvation, salvation from what? People say sin. Yes, sin. And sin and the consequences of sin, which is the judgment of the holiness of God. How many of you uh, are at peace with that message? Would you say amen? amen? There are some people who are at peace with that message, and then there are others of you get upset hearing things like that. You know, I gather myself, and you know, I took shower, came to church, and now you want to talk about things like that. Well, that's what today's text is. That's what Jesus is going to say. That's what John the Baptist uh, is saying. You know, message of Noah, right? The cute animals lining up and getting into the ark. But you know what the message of Noah is? It's about the judgment and salvation. What is salvation without the judgment? You think about it. You make sense out of this. Okay? Have you repented? I want to ask you because what is, you know, uh, I spend whole week a couple of weeks thinking about John the Baptist's uh, life and message. And I've come to a conclusion, wow, this is a Christian message. This is a Christian, Christian preacher, Christian person. I think that's what Christian is. That's what Christian pastor is at Christian churches. If I just tell you, you know, uh, you came to church, you're better than most of the people out there. And therefore, I think uh, heaven is given. You don't have to worry about that. You just need to be a better person. If I do that, I'm deceiving you. I'm completely deceiving you. 
Matthew chapter uh, 3, we're in chapter 3, there's been a 30 years of time lapse uh, from chapter 2 when we were talking about Jesus' infancy. Now, his ministry of the Messiah is about to be dawned. It's, it's, It's an amazing time, okay? The whole public ministry of Jesus is about to begin. Okay. And uh, all four Gospels, interestingly, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all begin with coming of John the Baptist. He is the precursor, and he signals coming of the Messiah. Isn't that something? You know, I always uh, ask you to, uh, this question. What are some stories that is written in all four Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Not that many. Okay, not that many. There are a handful, okay, less than 10. And one of them is John the Baptist. It's got to be something very, very important. So John the Baptist is like, he's the forerunner of the coming of the Messiah, who, two words, prepare the people and proclaim the coming of the king. Can I just give you an illustration? If Christ is coming back tomorrow and you did not know, and you wake up tomorrow morning and Christ came. What would happen to you? You will be shocked. You will be shy in shock. My job as a pastor and shepherd preaching the scripture is to prepare you. He's coming back soon. Scripture. We've been talking about it as we study First Peter for like eight months. Uh, one of the main themes was coming back of Christ. And this is different, ad, you know, Advent. This is Christ's first coming, his first uh, public ministry beginning. But basically, the message of John the Baptist is kingdom is come, coming, king is coming, and preparing you. If you're not prepared, you'll be shocked. And there's no more chance. Okay? Scripture clearly speaks about imminent coming and return of Christ. If you see that as a scriptural teaching, would you, would you say amen? amen? The truth is, whether you believe it or not, he's coming back soon, whether you believe it or not. People in Noah's time, they were eating, drinking, partying, vacationing, raising children, but the rain came. You know that. There is, uh, the, the whole story is a, a message of salvation. It's not a message of just God's, like, you know, uncontrolled wrath. God has been patient. God is long-suffering. God is patient. He's going to wait and be patient until, until his patience runs out, I guess. But his judgment and his coming is imminent. That's the Christian message. That is the gospel message. So his job, his ministry was to prepare the people as the forerunner or herald. Herald is someone in the ancient time who goes, let's say king is going from uh, New York to Philadelphia. He goes to Philadelphia first and tell people the king is coming. King is coming. And he prepared the road, I-95, make sure there is no potholes, you know. And he prepares the way, path, and tell people. And that's John the Baptist. Amazingly, he's a human being, and he was prophesied 700 years ago. The voice of of someone who is calling, crying out in the wilderness. It's really an awkward place to preach, isn't it? I don't know whether you've ever been to uh, Palestine, Israel. Uh, I've I've been to Israel one day, just one day. I went to Jordan a couple times, but... uh, uh, Israel just one day. I saw the desert, Judean desert. You know, if you drive on California somewhere, you see like 10 minutes of orange farm. An- anybody have seen it? It's, it's amazing. Wow. Amazing. 10 minutes you're driving, still all orange farm. In Israel, in Palestine, you drive for 10 minutes, it's all desert. Lifeless mountains. There's no life. Wilderness. And John the Baptist stood there telling people to come out. Come out. You want to be a Christian? Come out. Calling people to come out, proclaiming to them, 
signaling the new era, new age of the messianic age of the New Testament. Have you repented? I'm really asking you. If you are to stand God before God right now, have you repented? Or else you are in danger. Okay? It marks the end of the Old Testament, the age of the prophets and the law. And John the Baptist is the last prophet, interestingly, who will see Jesus. And uh, here's, the, here's an amazing thing. John, uh, Jesus spoke about John the Baptist several times in, in the Bible, in the New Testament, which is really, really special. And he said he's the greatest of all men who were born of a woman. Wow, what a, what a compliment. It's one thing for people to compliment you. Wow, you, you're such a great guy. You deserve this and you live like this. Your sacrifice is one thing for people to compliment you. But it is Jesus complimenting him. He's the greatest among all people who are born of women. Which is uh, that Jesus is talking about the, new, uh, the Old Testament era. Implying that he's greater than Moses, greater than David. Pretty amazing if you think about it. God's standard of greatness is different. You know that, right? In our world, what makes people great? Achievement, usually. Some sort of achievement. Size, level of education, amount that you have attained and saved up. You know, something big. That's a human, uh, I guess, uh, way of measuring the greatness. But God's way of measuring greatness if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you got to be a servant of all. Exactly how is the greatest in God's eye? I do not know. It's in some peculiar divine way, he's the greatest among uh, all men who's been born in uh, among, um, men, among the women. So his ministry signals the dawning of the ministry of Christ. That's what we are studying right now. And he's the last and the greatest prophet who called people to repentance. And that's what I want to do. You know, I was preparing this throughout the week, and I saw, wow, that's a real pastor, real Christian, real church, real Christian message. What is it about prosperity? Are you kidding me? That's a satanic message. We're going to see in the scripture. Okay? He speaks about the coming kingdom of God, coming king, savior, king from upcoming kingdom and judgment. That's Christian message. Okay? So that is an introduction. Um, we go into the text and the life of John the Baptist. It's not that long, but it's, it's, it's really packed. Okay? John chapter 3, let's look at the life and the message of John the Baptist. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Interesting place to preach. Okay? Because people want to be in the city. I want city life. I'm a city person. But John the Baptist is calling people to wilderness. Wilderness, right? So wilderness of Judea. And his first and Matthew's first gospel message and the New Testament's first gospel message is repent for the kingdom of heaven is near or at hand, which means it's imminent. It's imminent, people. And people don't listen. Look at you. Let me offend you a little bit. Look at you. You don't feel it's imminent. Say exam is tomorrow. What would you be doing? Hopefully you'll be studying. He's coming back any moment. And we're like eating, drinking, planning vacations. Okay? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he, John the Baptist, who has been spoken by the prophet Isaiah. That's about 700 years ago. When he said, the voice of crying in the wilderness. So he's the one who's crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of God, the Lord, Jesus, the Messiah, making his path straight. 
Now John, John's, uh, I guess, fashion style, wore a garment of camel's hair and leather belt. What is that about? Elijah. The last book of the Old Testament is Malachi, and last two verses of the Old Testament is about John the Baptist. Can you believe that? That's so special. Last two verses about the Old Testament of, of the Old Testament is about John the Baptist. Malachi chapter four, okay, speaks about coming of Elijah before the day of the Lord, before the Messiah comes, okay, turning the heart of the heart of the children to their fathers, and fathers to their children. I really believe when gospel is operating in your heart, you will. Turn to your fathers and children. I say this because um, I've seen for so many years you ignore your parents, you ignore your children. In fact, a lot of times you are bitter, bitter toward the, your, your parents. You hate them, but it'll turn the heart of the fathers to their children and children to their fathers. Okay? It'll bring repentance in your heart. That's when Christ comes. So now John wore a garment of ca camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Simple living. Not French gourmet dinner. We're so in tune about good food. Right? Simple dinner, simple, simple lifestyle. And what happened? Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were coming out to him. That's God's work, bringing people to repentance, right? What were they doing? And they were being baptized by John in the River Jordan, confessing their sins. You know what repentance is? You see your sin and you confess. I hate this. I cannot live like this. I cannot selfish like this. I cannot be mediocre like this. Repented. Have you repented? Will you continue to live in that kind of life, lifestyle? Selfish. You know, sin makes you very elusive. You know that, right? Sin makes you very, very elusive. Always trying to hide. Because you have to hide. Because you know, you know the shame of sin. If you're watching pornography all the time, you have to hide. But I know someone who's been in, uh, watching pornography for 20 years. And he or she is not that, even that old. 20 years watching pornography. I have to watch it. My testosterone. I don't know. You know, and then you get married and your wife and your husband is just an object. That's all he or she is. But you have to hide it because you cannot expose it. You have to be elusive rather than being honest, rather than being personal, rather than being transparent. But the gospel set that bondage free. I really do believe you could be set free from pornography. Would you say amen? Are you struggling with pornography, sin? That's just a example of external manifestation of your messed up heart, sinful heart. Pornography is not sin par excellence. Okay, it's just a manifestation of what you are made up of and what I am made up of. Okay, so confessing their sins. And then... This interesting scene, the, he, uh, he sees a lot of religious people coming out, a lot of people who do not have, who have not repented, come to church. I should be saying, at least they come to church. We can't do church without people, so at least they were coming out to church. But look at the way John responds to these hypocrites, people who would not repent, truly repent. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come into his baptism, supposedly confessing their sins, coming out to the wilderness. He said to them, you brood of vipers. That means you sons or descendants of snake, which means you are children of Satan. Wow. 
Can you imagine you come to church for the first time today and I call you, you, you children of Satan. You, 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 children of Satan. You, you, shut your mouth, you're just children of Satan. You're laughing, but like, can I just ask you, does he, does, it, uh, does he seem happy? I don't think he's happy. And I was meditating, I'm thinking about this. Is God happy? God is not happy about religious people coming to church year after year after year. No desire to truly repent. And just kind of like being an elusive person would not be transparent. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So coming out in repentance is fleeing from the wrath and judgment. Do you catch it? That's what Christianity is. That's what salvation is. Have you repented? Have you fleed to Christ? Many of you, I sense I'm not sure. Okay, I'm not sure. My ministry, my calling, my role as a shepherd of this ministry is not to please your ears and give you full security, but call you to wilderness and repentance to be the kingdom citizens of God. Okay? So, and then here is a statement, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. The picture is, I'm going to explain it later, your repentance and your fruit are similar weight. There is no fruit, good fruit, which means there is no repentance. That's what, that's what John the Baptist is saying. And then, do not presume. In other words, don't be, don't be deceived. And say yourself, we have Abraham as our father. You, we, all, we always think, of, think, think things like that. You know, I'm, I'm a, you know, I've been going to church all my life. I, I went to a Bible-preaching church. I went to this church. Well, my father is a pastor, elder, a missionary. No, there's no privilege, basically. Because that's what uh, the Jews did in, in Jesus' time. Abraham is our father, thinking that we are okay about all those Gentiles. I'm not sure whether they have a chance. They, they said, we are, per- we, are, we are fine because our father is Abraham. But those Gentiles, dogs, I'm not sure. You know, that's always what they believed. For I tell you, God is able to, from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. And look at this picture now. First message of the gospel. An axe, now even the axe is laid at the root of the tree. Can you picture that? You are the tree. An axe of God is laid on the root of your tree. You are the tree. I'm the tree. Could you picture that? Rather than just skimming through it, do you see a couple things? It's already laid there. It's imminent. It's urgent. Not at the trunk or branches, but at the root. So I try to picture the root is under, uh, under the underground. How do you put an axe there? I guess it is an expression of complete removal. Complete removal. Axe is laid at the root of the tree, and every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit, true repentance and good repentance, will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Hmm. Gospel message, people. You know who teaches this? Jesus does. Jesus did in John chapter 15. I am divine. You are the branches. He who does not bear fruit right, will be cut down and will be gathered and will be burned. Jesus taught exactly the same thing. This is gospel message. This is Jesus' message. Okay? And then the good news. That sounds like a bad news because unless you repent, this is what's going to happen to you. Here's the good news. I baptize you with water for repentance, which is only symbolic, but he who is coming after me, referring to Christ, Messiah, or Jesus, is mightier than I, whose sandal that I'm not worthy to carry, which means I'm not even uh, worthy to be his servant. 
That's what it means. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And here's a question for you. Do you have Holy Spirit in, in you? If not, you do not know him. Christians, by definition, Holy Spirit dwells in you. Okay? That's not symbolic. That's gospel reality. That is not symbolic. That's gospel reality. Okay? And then the last, last picture, which is a picture of a harvest and judgment. Okay, let's look at it. The winnowing fork. Winnowing fork. This is harvest. Okay? Is in his hand. Jesus' hand. And he will clear. Jesus will clear. His threshing floor. Jesus' threshing floor. And gather his wheat. Jesus' wheat into the barn. But the chaff will burn with unquenchable fire which is an expression Jesus used in, the, in, in other parts of the gospel for hell, eternal hell. Okay, that's John's message and the gospel. The first gospel that is written in the New Testament. Can I just ask you, is this the kind of Christianity do you believe in? How many of you are willing to say amen? Would you say amen? amen. <laughs> yeah, you guys are weird. <laughs> that's what you believe? That's what the scripture says. That's what the scripture says. And then there is others of you. No, 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 no. You know, I'm going to Stony Brook to preach today. Today I preached three times. And uh, I'm preaching from John's gospel. And interestingly, uh, I'm preaching from John chapter 12, which is the summary or the conclusion of Jesus' entire public teaching ministry. You know what it is? Here, here's the outline. Very simple. Those who believe and those who reject. And then he talks about judgment. And he said, I'm not going to be the one who's going to be judging because I, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world, Jesus said. But there's going to be one who's going to be judging you. You know who's going to be judging you? The word that I have spoken. The word of Jesus will, will, will judge you. I'm pausing because I know you will respond to that. That's so mean the word that jesus has spoken will the final word there is no heaven there is no god they'll be judged by the word jesus has spoken well i did this i did that they'll be judged by the word that jesus has spoken you know i come to this conclusion unless he's a crazy person liar if that is the truth it doesn't matter what you think. Only thing that will matter at the end on the last day is what he has spoken. Do you catch it? Let me give you one example that I'm going to be using in Stony Brook. If you try to gain your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for me and the gospel, you will gain it. That's Jesus' word. Okay? So... John the Baptist's ministry uh, is to prepare and proclaim the people and coming of the king. And uh, as a sign of true repentance, he baptized people. You know, we don't baptize anybody. We can't. Baptism in the church is a uh, God-ordained biblical thing, but it's a symbol of true repentance and true conversion. Unless the church leaders by God's grace, see the evidence of true repentance and true conversion. We should not baptize people. Well, you know, that'll, that'll help people to grow. You know, people say things like that, but that's, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. You truly repent it, so we baptize. Now, John was preaching in the wilderness, and I kind of picked, uh, draw the picture for you. You know, in Judean wilderness, you drive for like 10, 15 minutes. It's all barren, barren mountains and wilderness. And John the Baptist wearing camel's hair, you know, not, not very fashionable, with a leather belt. You know, I, I don't even know his hairstyle, but he was preaching, repent, you brood of vipers, <laughs> and kingdom of heaven is near. And so many people were coming out to him. What is about wilderness? 
What is, why wilderness? Do you remember in the Old Testament, God called his people Israelite out of Egypt, out of the slavery, out of the slavery of sin, slavery of Egyptian slavery into wilderness. Wilderness is the place of new beginning. Have you come out to wilderness? Or are you still living in the world? I'm really asking this question. That's repentance. I kind of need to do that. Your repentance never happened yet. Oh, I need to get off the train. If I want to go to Penn Station, I need to get off the train that goes to Babylon. Ah, I need to. You have not repented. You thought about repenting, but you never repented. In next section, in, John, uh, uh, in Matthew chapter 3, after we talk about John the Baptist, next week, Jesus begins his ministry by being baptized by John. Can you imagine that? In Jordan River, I went to Jordan River, it's dirty water. Oh, man, I don't want to be baptized. I like sprinkling better. <laughs> um, he gets baptized by, uh, by John the Baptist. What's baptism? Baptism is confessing your sin, and it's being united with Christ. But Jesus doesn't have any sin. But he's willing to be united with us sinners through his blood, through his death and resurrection. That's what baptism is. Jesus gets baptized, and as soon as he gets baptized, which signals is the beginning of his public ministry, Holy Spirit leads him to where? Wilderness. The place of new beginning. Have you come out to wilderness? I'm serious, people. Are you pretty much in the same place five years ago? In fact, many of you have gone even further away from the Lord. You're, you're, you're not, your heart is so far away from Him. You need to come out to wilderness. So that's where John preached. What was the message that he preached? Repentance. Let's talk about repentance. Uh, see if you have repented. Okay. Repentance, metanoia, and that is the first thing for you to come into kingdom. I don't think it has happened to all of you yet. I'm, I'm guessing, of course, because I'm only a man. But the evidence of life kind of shows your tree. That's how we do ministry, right? So John Brodus, Bible teacher, observes that whenever this word, repentance, metanoia, is used in New Testament, it is reference to change of your mind. Man, I cannot live like this. I'm not this or that. I'm not even sure whether I'm a Christian or not. I can't live like this. Am I a husband or not a husband? I can't live like this. In reference to change of mind and purpose from sin to holiness, I want to live for him. Have you repented? I'm seriously asking this question, people, because I don't want you to be delusional. I don't want you to be, okay? Repentance involves sorrow of sin. Blessed are those who are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is kingdom citizen. You hate sin. Oh, I don't want to watch pornography anymore. I'm losing my mind. I cannot be real and transparent to anybody. That's what pornography does. You become impersonal. You could never be honest with anyone because you're always objecting ob objectizing someone for your pleasure you always make excuses my testosterone my at my age there are people who watch pornography in their 40s and 50s oh if i get married i think it'll go away no it will not i'm telling you it will not you are in slavery and what I'm trying to say is not to condemn just pornography, but that's just one external manifestation of your gross heart. That's what I'm trying to say. Just, that's just one 
external manifestation of what you are made up of. John Brodus, repentance involves sorrow for sin. The sorrow lives to change of thinking. I cannot live and die and get married and stay like this. This is gross. I'm a disgusting person. I have to change. I, I want to make up my mind. You have a desire. Godly desire. Have you repented? And then conduct. Of course, conduct. Not only I want to, but now I do. That's repentance. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the sorrow that God gives leads to salvation. That's how you work out your salvation. Repentance is what it means to become a Christian and working out your salvation. Salvation is done by God's grace, but Holy Spirit makes you repent and become more godly and work out your salvation. So John's command or here, repent for the kingdom of the year. And in John, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 4, Jesus will say the same thing in the brink of his ministry. Repent for the kingdom of his, is, is near. John's command, Jesus' command, or Bible's command, or God's command to repent, therefore could be rendered as be converted. You're born again. Have you been born again? I'm seriously asking this question. Have you been born again? Unless you're born again, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay? The reality of kingdom. Can I ask you to think, uh, think with me? This is philosophically maybe, but simple. If God is real, if the God of the Bible is real, can there be any greater reality than God? If Christ is coming back tomorrow, really judge the living and the dead, you and me. Could there be anything more urgent than that? And yet, you don't care. And yet, you heard this time after time, and you just kind of don't care. What's wrong with me? Repent because of the imminent coming of the kingdom is Christian message. It's the gospel message. And we are called to preach the gospel message. Not if you come to church, your, your marriage will get a little bit better and children will get into Harvard. No, that's satanic message. This is Christian message that we see in Matthew gospel. And... Um, what Jesus preached, I mean, John the Baptist preached, okay? So, in Malachi, John wore a garment of camel, camel's hair and leather belt. In Malachi, uh, last two verses, let me just read it to you. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And he will turn, repent, turn your heart from uh, turn the heart of the fathers to their children and children to their fathers. And listen, I came and I'll strike the land unless you turn. Does that sound like Christianity you believe? I hope you do because that's what the scripture says. And he's the Elijah. And Jesus affirms that he's the Elijah. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. John is the last prophet of the Old Testament. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay. But when these people came, uh, Sadducees and Pharisees uh, came out, John was very, very upset. And here is what he's saying. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Can I just ask you, I'm, this is a real practical question. What kind of fruits do you have in your life? I'm, I'm really asking you. Guys. Like when you have a job, is there like yearly assessment? What do you call that? Yearly review. Let's do some review. 
What kind of fruits do you have in your Christian life? What happens after the review? Warning, right? Or praise? Okay, let's have a review. What kind of fruits do you have in your life? I'm really asking you. What kind of fruits should I have? I could tell you, we, we talked about this in prayer meeting. If you have been going to church 10 years, do you have any disciples who decide to follow Christ by grace because of your life? Do you have any disciples? John, you have, you've been going to church about 10 plus years, right? Many of you went to church 10 plus years. Do you have any disciples? That's a fair thing to review. How about godliness, godly passion? Do you have godly passion to build this kingdom, church, lost, and honor God? Do you have it? Do you have that kind of fruit? Do you have a great desire to know God through the scripture? These are fruits. If you don't, what kind of fruits do you have? You have grown in love for the world? Danger sign. Let's have some review. So when we say, when he says all these hypocrites coming out to church, excuse me, to desert, right? And he was very, very upset and basically said, you know, who warned you, you brood of vipers? Who warned you to flee to wrath to come? And then he says, bear fruits and in keeping with repentance. The word in keeping is axios, which means it's, it's the equal weight. Here's a, here's a scale. You, wa you watch me. Here's a scale. And here is your repentance. And then here is your fruit. So I'm asking... If you have a hard time looking at your repentance record, what's your fruit record? You should review that, actually. You do that at work, right? And usually the outcome is good or bad. Oh, it depends. <laughs> okay, depends. Depends. Is there anybody who, wow, looking at John, I want to live for him. I want to live for him. I want to be faithful to church. I want to raise my children in godly ways. Is there any that kind of fruits? I'm, I'm really asking you people. You know, John the Baptist preaches like that, min do ministry like this. And this is the first gospel message of the New Testament. Okay, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, true conversion and repentance produces fruits. Evidence of true repentance and conversion, there is fruits. Have you ever seen, my illustration is, have you ever seen a baby that was born and never grow? Lydia is growing like, every time I walk in here, And do not presume to say to yourself, we are Abraham, we have Abraham as our father. Do you have any of those things? Well, at least I've been going to church all these years. I taught my father is a elder. I at least I give tithe. I go to missions trip. My brother is a pastor. You, you think of all these false securities. You know, in, in, in Jesus' time, the Jews thought that they were very, very chosen special people, and they were, right? And therefore, they're in, no matter what, because of Abraham is our father. But those Gentiles, dogs, oh, unless they become proselytes, really, truly repent, they, they will not get any chance. They thought like that. And basically, John the Baptist is saying, do not presume, which means don't make that kind of mistake. Do not presume. Do not uh, presume to say yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, because God is able to uh, make these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Okay? And then the picture. Now the axe is laid 
at, uh, uh, laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And I see speaking to you. I need to prepare your heart. What kind of fruits do you have? X is laid at the root of your tree. And every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Are you prepared for the coming of the king? I'm going to ask you, and I pray that you will answer in faith and humility. How many of you are prepared for the king's return? Would you say amen? amen. I ask this question because I want you to hear it. Some of you could say amen, some of you can't. Because this is not a delusional thing. Okay? And then the good news. I baptize you with water for repentance. In other words, I'm preparing for coming of true Messiah. And my baptism is call you to, to repentance. And it's only symbolic. It's only symbolic. But the one who come, come, who's coming after me, referring to Christ is mightier than I, much greater than I. He's so much greater that I am not even worthy to be his servant. That's what he's saying. And that is true. Remember in John's gospel, he said, he keeps saying, he must increase and I must decrease. That's a, that's a true servant of God. I think that's a true Christian. That's a true church. He must increase and I must decrease. That's a true Christian. Have you repented? If you have not repented, you're in danger. The, the axe is laid at the root of your tree. God could, God could do that, you know. Okay. Whose sandal I'm not worthy to, uh, worthy to carry. And here is, the, here is the gospel message. He will baptize you. He's going to be united with you with the Holy Spirit and the fire. Holy Spirit is not a symbol. Holy Spirit is third person of tr Trinity. And the entire teaching of the New Testament basically says that if you become Christian, He dwells in you. He manos in you. Just as Father is in the Son and Son is in the Father, Holy Spirit is in you. And you are in Christ. That's the gospel reality. Have you repented? I'm looking at you, and please look at me. Have you repented? Have you repented? I'm really asking all of you. No fruit, no repentance. And John's message is, you need to preparing the people of the coming of the king. Okay? I want to close with verse 12. I want to close. Okay. The picture is harvest. You know there's going to be harvest. There's going to be harvest. Which is the picture of a final judgment. Okay. Judgment is always separation. Remember that? And You know, in my mother's funeral, I, I spoke the same message. Judgment is always the separation. Here's the picture of separation. Okay. His winnowing fork. Winnowing fork is this. It's some sort of fork that lifts up the wheat. And the wheat and the chaff are always together. In the church, there are wheat, wheat, wheat and then there are chaffs. In the church, there is. Right here. There is fork that he lifts up. His, uh, what he, uh, what. What the judge is doing is doing the separation. He lifts it up in, in the air, and the wheat, because of the weight, it's going to fall down on the threshing floor. But the chaff, the, the cover, has no weight, so it's going to blow away. So keep doing this. All the wheat will fall back on the threshing floor, and the chaff will be blown away. And what, what, do, what do the harvest do? He gathers his wheat 
into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with the unquenchable fire. And I'm asking you to look at, do you have weight of faith in your heart? Do you see clearly the judgment is separation? You know, Bible speaks about families will be separated. Brothers will be separated. Judgment is separation. Jesus came to gather into his barn. And how did he do that? He took your judgment. So that's the good news. That's the good news. How many of you say that's good news? If you don't understand that, you're lost. You're lost. You're lost. You are in darkness. You have to know this. Right? John's last point, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And he will clear the threshing floor, a picture of a harvest, and he's clearly doing the separation. Some of, some of you, I, I pray that all of you will be wheat. You will be sheep, not the goats. Right? Wheat and the chaff. And how is he going to do that? Threshing floor with the winnowing fork. And the weight of yourself will either fall or you will be blown away. So many people are blown away from church to churches. Right? They're looking for what their hearts want to hear. Just like what 2 Timothy says, rather than hearing the truth and truly repent and submit to his kingship. Coming of his kingdom and the kingdom message is the greatest reality. Unless you believe that, you're not a Christian. You're not a Christian. <laughs> You're not. doesn't matter how long you went to church. Pharisees and Sadducees are not Christians. They're not Christians. The last thing I want to share <clears throat> is John's life and ministry. We kind of considered it briefly. Uh, and Jesus said, he's the greatest men who are born of women. Do you care about that? I mean, there's one thing for you to hear. Wow, he's a good guy in this by worldly standard. John, uh, you know, he's a good guy. He went to good school. And he's well-educated, but he's so humble. We could say different things. But that's not what I'm talking about. This is what Jesus values of you. He's the greatest. We don't know exactly what his measure of greatness is. But we know from, uh, from the scripture in, the, in God's kingdom, if you want to be great, learn to be a servant of all. What's a servant? What's a servant? This servant prepared the coming of his king and prepare you. You know, I, I was thinking about this. Man, that's a, tr that's a true pastor. That's a true Christian pastor. That's godly, Pastor. Lord, help me that I may not always worry about this or that. Now, a lot of people say we need to have at least people come to church, whether they're hypocrites or not, to do a church. But look at, look at this message. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the, uh, this, this wrath that is coming? You know wrath is coming unless you truly repent. And then he says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Unless you do that, the axe is laid at, your, at the root of your life as a tree. Unless you bear good fruit, it'll be cut down and thrown into the fire. So repent. Come to Christ. That's the gospel message. And Lord, may I never stop preaching that message of repentance and the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, yes. I hope you could hear. Yes. 
Some of you are going to hear and you, you're not going to repent and be the same. That's tragic. I think that's tragic. You must repent. Repent is God's command. It's not a suggestion for your prosperity. Repent and live. That's the gospel message of coming, coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray.